Kata. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I'm going to go off script. So my company, no one knows this but a few of us, used mastering the Rockefeller habits. I've never met this man. I love you. I love you, too. We do. So I should be on this guy's PR front, because it really worked. All right. So uh, my job today is to tell you about my journey with conscious capitalism. I'm probably the wrong guy uh, to be speaking tonight, and I'll make that clear in a bit. Um, but I thought I'd start with the end. Uh, I took over a company in 2008. It makes technology uh, and print materials, books, for children. We now serve 20% of the K-8 children in the United States. If your kids use something called iReady, uh, that's what they use. And if no kid likes their curriculum, so don't blame me. <laughs> uh, we've grown by 1,000% since 2008. We've arguably, by a bunch of metrics, had the, the best performance of anyone in the industry. There's a thing called Ed Reports, the Consumer Reports of Education, who's ranked our product the best. We have the highest renewal rates of any software company in our industry. Five times the last five years, we've won the globe's best places to work. 96% of the people who work there would recommend their best friend to work at Curriculum Associates. It turns out 4% don't have any friends. <laughs> the question is why? Why did we grow by 1,000% when the industry grew by 1% to 2%? One of the reasons is we use mastering the Rockefeller habits. But the big, big reason is that we're a conscious company, a conscious company that I inherited and tried not to screw up. So let me start with my journey, as I'm supposed to describe. I was born in Santiago, Chile. I was one of the, I think I'm the only, or the, excuse me, the first child born to a Peace Corps representative of the United States. I moved at three months uh, to outside of Boston. There was some mental illness in my family that was complicated. My parents got divorced. My mother, after settling down after a few years, married the local priest. It was Boston. <laughs> and for those of you Catholics grabbing your rosemary beads, just know he left the priesthood first. Uh, from there, I was a working class kid in a great school district. And a superintendent of that school came by and, uh, and helped me out personally. And I thought I was the most special person in the world. Uh, he tried to convince me that I could do something with my life and be a person uh, who gave and was in service. And I thought I was the only one. He actually wrote in my college recommendation that I was one of the top two or three people he had ever met in his career to go to college. I found out later from his secretary, he wrote that 20 times a year for the last 30 years. 600 kids were the top two or three. I went on to uh, Northwestern and then to Wall Street. I was a master of the universe in the late 1980s. At the age of 22, uh, because I became a trader, I made in what's in today's dollars is $250,000. I started volunteering at a place called Covenant House, which was five blocks away from where I worked in New York. It was a homeless shelter for children five blocks away. There, I actually didn't go there just for an hour. I, I spent uh, sometimes all night there. I remember taking a kid with an axe pick wound, an eighth grade kid, no longer in school, to get it sewn back up after he had a drug fight um, with an ice pick. I remember seeing a mother who was holding her child up, trying to sell the child uh, because she was suffering from crack addiction. Five blocks away from making what other people were making, millions of dollars, there were homeless children in America. And I got to thinking, why is it that this exists? Why can't we take the for-profit great things that happen in one place and bring them to the people in need? I went on to business school, wrote my essay about that, uh, and I started working in 
for-profit education at a place called Kaplan. Uh, and uh, after a while uh, of doing that and having some good success, I uh, had an unfortunate thing in my life where my brother uh, died in an auto accident. And I remember walking down the aisle thinking to myself, have I done enough to be a conscious leader? Have I done enough to deserve whatever eulogy would be given to me? And so I left this, all the trappings of for-profit, and I decided I'm going to go into a nonprofit because that's what I should do. And I ran an organization called Jumpstart, which is a wonderful place that works with three to five-year-old children around the country. And I served 15,000 children doing this work around the country. But it required that every day I ask for money from very rich people, Howard Schultz, Bain Capital people, uh, sometimes the government. Back then when he was alive, Senator Kennedy. But I only got to 15,000 children, and I thought, there has to be a better way. And then I met a man named Frank. He was 82, Frank Ferguson. Had a little company called Curriculum Associates. It was 2008, and the world was falling apart. And I asked him, is there any way to take a company uh, and make it a conscious company? And he had found a way, because he didn't have ownership from anyone else, and he got to decide everything long term. And I asked him, uh, I actually cold called the man, I asked him if I could run his company, and he said, I'll agree under the following condition. You do it for 20 years. I thought he was crazy. <laughs> and I, after some time, agreed, and I signed a 20-year employment contract. This is my halftime speech. I've been there 10 years. And so, from 2008 uh, to now, why did we succeed? Because we thought long-term, I didn't have to answer to any short-term pressures, okay? So I didn't have, uh, in our industry, there was a ton of public companies that answered to Wall Street, and every three months you have to have earnings, and we're trying to figure out what to do best for kids. Our, in our company, two-thirds of our kids are on free and reduced lunch, the federal definition of poverty. We could think long-term. But then when I was hiring, and this is the most important thing, when I was hiring and I said, I have a 20-year employment agreement. We will only do what's best for kids. We are going to make some profit along the way, good profit, but never build, rob a bigger house, suck it dry, flip it, spin it, do short-term things, and we are gonna act with 100% integrity on all things every day, and the moment anyone lies, including the top salesperson in the company, we don't write it up and put you on probation, we fire you. We have a 100% money back guarantee all the time, which is very unusual in government procurement. None of these ideas are my own. These ideas came from Frank and the people already there. And so it turns out that if you're competing for great talent with people who cut corners, who, don't, who dump people the moment they have a recession, who don't treat people with grace, they don't want to work there as much as being in a conscious company. And when the company was struggling and near bankruptcy, the employees at a conscious company stay with you, are loyal, will do anything to get it right. And the company that was dumping people had people leaving, wanting to work there. And little by little, we chipped away until we created technology. Uh, this is, by the way, again, in 2008, 2010, we barely had any money. Created technology that wasn't very good. We made it a little bit better and crawled our way up. Because you know what? The customers knew. The customers also knew that we were a conscious company. And when they had very little money, Back then, when the budgets were tight, they chose us because we had the best values, we had the best people, we had the best service. Our company won because we are a conscious company. It's amazing what can happen if you get the best people in the room in a business like ours where there's hundreds of little decisions a day. One person I met with once always said, it's easier to be an outstanding recruiter and an average manager than an average recruiter and an outstanding manager. 
and conscious capitalism, conscious companies lead people to want to come to your company. And if you have great people and you treat them with grace, you've already won. You're already going to win. And that's what happened in our company, why we're succeeding, and why I recommend it to you. That's my conscious story. Thank you. <laughs>